The goal of this topic is to understand how we can develop evidence on the costs and benefits of expanding Medicaid. It's harder than you might think to figure out what such a large and long-standing program is actually doing. The program has been around for 50 years. You would think people would have already figured out how much it costs and what the benefits of it are, but there are real challenges in developing the evidence base that policymakers need. That evidence is difficult to assess because people who are on Medicaid look different from people who are not on Medicaid. Making very simple comparisons of the healthcare use of people on Medicaid to the the healthcare use of the uninsured, for example, fraught and not likely to produce solid estimates of the actual costs and benefits of the program. Well, why is that? You need to know what would have happened to the people who are on Medicaid if they weren't on Medicaid. That's the incremental cost or benefit of expanding the program. How do you know what they would have done in the absence of the program itself? Well, you might just look at something like mortality and say, what's the mortality rate of people who are on Medicaid? What's the mortality rate of the uninsured? And you might from that guess what the effect of the program Medicaid is for covering the uninsured on mortality. The problem with that is that the way you get on Medicaid is perhaps by being very low income, perhaps by having a disabling health condition. Both of those factors independently affect mortality. It turns out that people who are on Medicaid have a higher mortality rate than the uninsured. But that doesn't mean that the program itself is killing off beneficiaries. It might mean that those other factors that get people into Medicaid in the first place also pose their own health challenges. So the goal is to separate out those confounding factors, those other factors that affect both insurance coverage and health outcomes and healthcare use from the effects of the program itself. And there are a lot of sophisticated strategies for doing that. That simple comparison that I gave is clearly not a sophisticated strategy, but there are many others that involve using variation in which states cover which people, using program rules to try to really isolate the effect of the program itself. There's a real danger in just using the observation of what you see, but there are also challenges in using these quasi-experimental approaches. Quasi-experimental is the word that we use for things like comparing different states with different program eligibility rules or comparing populations who are just eligible versus just not eligible based on some factor like income or age. And those strategies can be very helpful, but they have some limitations. Some examples of those that you might read about include difference in difference estimators, regression discontinuity estimators, instrumental variables. Now, those strategies have been used to try to gauge the effect of Medicaid for children, looking at states where some children are eligible but are not eligible in a neighboring state, looking at the effect of Medicare for populations who are 64 versus 65. The challenge is that those estimates are giving you a pretty good estimate of the effect of Medicaid or Medicare coverage for that little population, for 64 or 65 year olds, or for children just around 100% of the poverty level, but they may not generalize to other populations. For example, under the ACA, we're particularly interested in what happens to low income adults who are between 19 and 64 and eligible for Medicaid expansions. That may not be the same as the effect for older populations who age on to the Medicare program. There's also a challenge in those kinds of studies because some states expand Medicaid for a reason while other states choose not to expand Medicaid for a reason. And you have to wonder how that underlying reason affects health care use and health outcomes for the population. For example, is a state expanding Medicaid in response to a public health crisis where the population is faring particularly badly before the program? Or is a state expanding Medicaid because it has extra financial resources and it's at the same time devoting extra resources to welfare, housing, education, other programs that might benefit the same population? It's very difficult to isolate the effect of a program expansion like Medicaid from those choices that states are making in contexts that may be very different from state to state. What you'd really like is a randomized controlled trial a trial where you have a control group and a treatment group that look exactly the same except for the fact that they're eligible for the public insurance program. We rarely have that kind of evidence in public policy, however. Why is that? Well, there are ethical and logistical concerns to randomizing populations into major social insurance programs. 
Suppose you wanted to know the effect of early childhood education, Head Start, Pre-K, elementary school on adult earnings. You might think that it would be important to gauge that in deciding how much to spend on those programs, but we would never set up an experiment where we gave half the kids the best pre-K education that we could and we locked the other half of the kids in the basement, waited 30 years and saw what their earnings were. There are clearly serious ethical problems with a program like that and that's why it's never been done. For other public policy questions like the effect of expanding Medicaid, we rarely have such an opportunity that isn't prohibited by ethical concerns or logistical barriers. There's one exception in the 70s, the RAND health insurance experiment. The RAND health insurance experiment randomized people into different types of insurance products. People who had more generous insurance coverage or less generous insurance coverage. They had higher co-pays or lower co-pays, higher deductibles or lower deductibles. That experiment randomly assigned people to different types of insurance policies, but gave everyone insurance with a maximum out-of-pocket loss of $1,000. And that experiment generated the estimates we still use today of how sensitive enrollees are to prices for healthcare. How much does their healthcare use change when their copay goes up? Estimates from that study suggest that when you raise co-pays by 10%, people consume 1 or 2% less health care, and that there's very limited, if any, adverse consequence for their health. We use those estimates today in thinking about how changing program parameters or deductibles or co-insurance for publicly insured patients or privately insured patients would affect health care use. There have been scores of studies since then that have validated those estimates, but the reason they have such staying power and such salience is because the random assignment let us really isolate the effect of program generosity or patient cost sharing itself. If you didn't have random assignment like that, you might be concerned that patients who know that they're going to have high health care expenses are more likely to enroll in, in programs with lower deductibles to keep their out-of-pocket costs down, and that would give you a biased estimate of the effect of the copay itself. That's the RAND health insurance experiment from the 70s, but it can't answer the question of what expanding public insurance does because everybody in that study had insurance. Well, one study that I'm going to focus on today is the Oregon health insurance experiment, one that I led with a co-author at MIT, Amy Finkelstein, and many colleagues in Oregon. We looked at the effect of expanding Medicaid because of a strange opportunity in Oregon where the state had about 10,000 spots available in its low-income insurance program, but it knew that it had a lot more demand for the program. So because of those limited resources that were available and the big population that potentially wanted the program, they decided that the most fair thing to do would be to expand the insurance program by lottery. They drew names from the waiting list by chance, and the people whose names were drawn got the opportunity to apply for the insurance program, and the people whose names were not drawn did not get that opportunity. They did that out of policy necessity. But a byproduct of that was the creation of the ideal experimental framework for evaluating the effects of Medicaid. The people whose names were drawn looked just like the people whose names weren't drawn, except for the luck of the draw. And this gave us the randomized controlled trial that policymakers had been needing for decades, but had never before been available. This is an example of states' options under the Medicaid program. I mentioned before that states have choices about eligibility and about program parameters. Only about half of states before the ACA chose to cover low-income adults without disabling conditions in their Medicaid program. Oregon had been one of those states, but it had closed the program to new enrollment because of budget constraints. States have that choice, and Oregon chose to expand again in 2008 based on those increased resources. This gives us the opportunity to gauge the effect of expanding Medicaid on a whole range of outcomes. I've talked about both the costs and the benefits of health insurance. On the cost side, we're going to look at how expanding insurance affects health care utilization. I mentioned the RAND health insurance experiment. That suggests to us that in health care markets, like many other markets, demand slopes down. When the price of something goes up, people consume less of it. It's surprising to a lot of people to think that healthcare works that way, but it turns out that it does, and we have lots of evidence that backs that up. 
So we're going to look to see whether expanding Medicaid has that similar effect of increasing health care use. It's not obvious that it would because people who are on Medicaid may not get access to providers if they're not paid enough to see Medicaid patients. The uninsured already consume some care through uncompensated care, through clinics, through charity care. So there might not be such a big difference in health care use. We need to look at the data to see that. On the benefit side, we're going to look both at the financial protections that I mentioned before. Do people fare better in their ability to pay their other bills, in their access to credit and their credit reports? And of course, we're also going to look at their health outcomes, both physical health and mental health. To do that, we needed to collect a lot of data through the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. We collected hospital data, credit report data, emergency department data, and then we collected physical measures of health, including blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetic blood sugar control, obesity measures, as well as a host of self-reported physical and mental health outcomes. And I'm going to use that data, as well as results from other studies, to give you a sense of what the evidence tells us about the costs and benefits of expanding public health insurance.